COVID Conversations white background that says COVID-19 conversations, free COVID-19 information sessions for people with disability and their supporters. With QDN logo and Health Consumers Queensland logo and three images of COVID-19 virus image. Thank you everybody for joining our session this morning and the conversation about getting the healthcare you need during this time and actually being prepared and knowing your rights. And I guess when I look at this topic, um, it is complex, but it is also something that is very important for everybody. And I never expected to actually first-hand experience <coughs> Sorry about that, guys, but never got to um, first-hand experience something like this and end up in the hospital for the last month um, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I thought that the planning and documenting of everything, the many different panels that I've been involved with, and the many different conversations I'd had about COVID-19, I was absolutely planned and had everything perfect, not expecting something like sepsis to jump into the equation and then having to actually, I guess, test everything that I had done with all of the planning tools, the groups I'd been on, um, and actually using the different documents that we have developed within QDN. And so it was really a very good testing ground and a testing place for that process to happen. There were some gaps within that hospital process and I'll talk about them as we go along this morning. But I think where I'd like to start was the importance of the actual planning. Actually documenting and using the different templates that QDN has on their website was to me something that was very helpful and very worthwhile. Putting down um, all of the details um, in, onto a piece of paper and then I actually then did some laminating, had that with me and was able to use that when I actually was put into the hospital and had to actually justify certain things with my level of care and needs and the advocacy that I had to do with myself, my family um, and my carers within that hospital environment was very much supported by that document. And I also was able in that time when I was very sick to be able to um, use that, not to have to repeat things hundreds of times. It was all there. And so things like, for me, it was important to have documented even um, my company information so people could get in, um, you know, with passwords and things like that. And I put those extra things into my plan and had those backup things to actually support so when I was able, I then was able to have my equipment and things like that at the hospital as well. So I think the very basics and starting with the things that you actually have to think about every day um, to actually be prepared, who you need to talk to, what you need to tell them, what sort of information about your health needs to be documented, which doctors and contact numbers, all of those sorts of things need to be put in place, the actual care that you need. So the fact that I needed two carers, I needed to be fully hoisted, um, I needed to um, have a bed, I couldn't be um, rolled, my spine was too unstable. All of those sorts of things come in and are part of that planning process. Documenting who you are, what you lead, and how you can do it best um, for your care in this time. I was actually self-isolating probably from 
around the start of March and spent a lot of time at home um, putting into place that plan, making sure I knew what I needed, what would work best for me, um, if at all the thought of having to go out and if something went wrong, if my carers weren't able to support me, where would I access other carers? How could I keep my team safe? And so I um, limited my number of carers to three. So I had a driver and two other carers. And then I had one that I could call on, but I didn't really want to call on because it may endanger the rest of our team. And that had worked perfectly. Um, I think that is something that you really have to consider. We had to consider what we were going to do with our PPE, how we were going to make sure that we had access to all of those things that were necessary. And as the director of my company, there was only me to make those decisions. So to have a plan that was written was something that I think was very worthwhile, both for me and my staff and my family and for the people who actually put those supports in place medical wise as well. So by that, I mean people like my GP, like the nurses in that GP practice, um, my specialists, uh, people who I went to have support like podiatrists, etc. So the whole team behind how my healthcare worked. All of that was going along pretty nicely until August the 3rd, when I had to be rushed to hospital with sepsis. Now, that actually altered um, really how I was planning, how I was working with my carers, how I felt safe, which is probably one of the keys to this whole process, is being safe and feeling safe and how to ensure that that actually works and how that your healthcare still needs to be done. And I had been sorry about the again. I had been accessing and making sure that all my supports were in place and still safely attending the hospital for outpatient visits and my podiatrist and regular health checks that I think we have to ensure happen for everybody. And I, at the same time, was looking at what are my rights? What if something happened? What would um, I need if I went to hospital? How could I ask for that? And why could people question what I was asking for and then how would I ensure that I had a strong voice? Um, and what I didn't factor in was how, when you are incredibly sick, that you are altered and you have an altered perception. So it's very important to really know what your rights are before you're thrown into that situation. And I think I loved the document that QDN developed and being part of that group to develop it, I think really helped me in that situation. But I really know that it would help anyone who actually read through that document and then actually use that, especially the, even the postcard size document to look at and rework out what they need essentially. And also know that it's your right to have your carers, right to have your family and they can't be put together and when the hospitals are looking at numbers, they can't class carers as your family. And I found that there was a few things that had to be clarified, especially in my um, journey through the hospitals. And I think that there are big gaps um, in understanding about disability and health. And I think awareness, at the very basic levels of training for 
nursing, doctors, auxiliary staff, the people who bring the um, meal around every day, the people who develop the meal, the dietitians, <clears throat> really need to have a training and awareness of what it's like for a person with disability in a hospital. I know that I had all the supports and things worked out in the end, but I think it was because I knew what my rights were. I knew what I was entitled to ask for. And there are a number of times when within those processes, people questioned or they looked at you in a different way as if you wouldn't know what you actually wanted or needed. So the documentation of that was incredibly important, I thought, to the process actually working. And I tried as I went through each day and as I became more well um, to actually educate and let people know about the way things needed to be done or adjusted so it worked for everybody. And a team approach actually worked with my family knowing and having that background from those documents and from the preparedness process. And the real, I guess, strength was my carers who got me to hospital in time, you know, with a couple of hours to spare. The real problem to start with in this process was the equipment at the hospital and trying to have my hoist get me onto the CAT scan and the hoist didn't fit under the CAT scan bed. And I couldn't be turned because of my spine and the instability of that. And they had no idea. There was like eight people in the room. Woody's trying to like turn me, put a spinal board under. That area I feel in my planning needs to be written and really um, documented and maybe even leads me to make some more visits to that hospital and that area to really um, emphasise how dangerous it would be to even try to turn me and what would happen to my back and neck. But that situation created a problem in the process and that was a non-human response but still something that can be documented in that plan and looked at to actually overcome because if without that CAT scan image nothing could be done and nothing could progress and I couldn't go into ICT and have the pick line put in and have that chance to survive. So I guess all of those things have to be documented. You have to really brainstorm you have to think deeply. And even if you don't think it's going to impact on you, put it down, write it in your plan and get ready and be prepared because you never know within this time what might actually happen. Look, thank you so much, Sharon. Such valuable learnings for everyone from your experience of hospital and healthcare, um, from the experience of a person with a disability during this time of COVID. Um, fantastic to hear how you and your team benefited from you being able to plan for this time, to have conversations, to document your choices, to use the QDN toolkit, um, which you had been involved in developing. Um, Michelle will give us some more details on that toolkit later in the session. Um, but I just also wanted to reflect on um, the fact that we are lucky in Queensland to have this time um, to be able to plan and prepare, unlike um, some of our um, counterparts, friends and, and colleagues in, in southern states. Um, so thank you so much for um, sharing this morning, Sharon. Thanks, Melissa. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Karen um, for her experience of this time as a carer. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thanks QDN and HCQ for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this webinar is taking place, which for me in Brisbane is the Turbul and Jagera people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as um, Melissa said, my name's Karen and I'm the parent and carer of a child with disability who also happens to be what we call a frequent flyer in the health system. Um, I think, uh, Shelley, you were going to put my slides up. 
hopefully they will come. I've put They're coming. Slides. They're coming. Thank you, Michelle. I've put a few slides together. Um, so the second mm -hmm. slide would be great. Thank you. So from our family's experience, hospitals can be intimidating places like the picture on the left, generally because you're unwell when you're going and you're probably quite stressed about it. And certainly with a child, that's been at times our experience. But that's even before COVID-19, um, when you see staff in full PPE and, you know, recent changes now, um, most hospitals and certainly one we've gone are now full masked and PPE. So for our family and many others, we wish we didn't need to have to come to hospital or require healthcare. We want to be home and we want to be well and in our community with our family and friends. But illness doesn't wait for anything and chronic health conditions like my daughter has means that this hasn't been possible and we've still had to attend even during the COVID pandemic and also have surgery. It's so important to still access that essential care for you or your family member. Um, especially with people with disability like my daughter who may have these underlying medical conditions that make them more at risk or requiring more frequent care. So that's why the Know Your Rights Guide is so valuable. So in the next slide, please, Shelley. Um, because it's about people with disability accessing healthcare equitably and in the best prepared and informed way. Because as Sharon's story has shown and our own lived experience, information is advocacy and knowledge and lived experience are powerful. So the Know Your Rights Guide reflects the learnings of people with disability and accessing the health system. So hopefully one day it won't matter which health service you use on which day or which team member you get, um, because people with disability are automatically by the systems and culture in place given equitable supported access and know how to use equipment and know how to support good communication, for example. And we don't have to advocate for this. But in the meantime, until that is the case across every team, every service, every day, it's recommended you know your rights, you're informed and you're prepared. So next slide, please. So this picture on the left is quite a well-known picture because um, it's about, you know, how the step represents equity. Um, so it's not about getting the same or providing the same, as the same will not likely be fair or just. And it's not also about getting more, it's about getting the right support and assistance. So for a person with disability, equitable healthcare access could be having a support worker or carer paid or unpaid attend hospitals with appointments with them. And it's important to know your rights in this regard and in putting this document together, that was a key point of stress was about knowing that you turn up to hospital and your carer can attend because they're not a visitor, they're a carer, whether they're paid or unpaid and they're essential for equitable access for many people with a disability. So next slide, please. So the Know Your Rights Guide is all about being informed and prepared. Now there are checklists at the back and I really recommend these as a guide for preparing for hospital and accessing healthcare generally. So in our family's experience, having that key information prepared in advance like Sharon, when it's not a crisis or a stressful period, so doing them when you're not in crisis, that has been enormously helpful. It's also helped build our health literacy and our advocacy and helped us to avoid complications and also get out of hospital sooner. So a lot of this information is relevant even without COVID-19, but it's so more important with COVID-19 and going to hospital. So our daughter, for example, can become very anxious in a hospital setting, particularly when she doesn't know what is going on and staff in full PPE can be quite intimidating too. And communication with the masks, for example, um, less effective. So we, in partnership with our healthcare team, have developed tailored tick sheets that the staff use when she's going in for surgery and for routine observations and delivering things like IV medications when she's an inpatient in hospital. So for our family, those kind of pre-prepared materials um, have made a huge difference between having an anxious and a distressed patient to an empowered and engaged and a compliant patient. So we've used our pre-surgery consultations to make sure these steps are in place long before we come to hospital. 
And that investment makes an enormous difference to the safety and quality of our daughter's care and her overall healthcare experience. We also maintain a current list of medications and um, the pharmacy or your GP and our experience can assist with these. And we also have our list of key hospital specialists and key event dates. And in our case, we've used the government's My Health Record to help with this. And our phone. So our phone is also a priceless tool. We use it to take notes, record our questions and the answers from health staff and photograph or video medical events, which has the benefit of a date and timestamp. So, <coughs> excuse me, preparing in advance um, all that information per the Know Your Rights checklist on the communication needs, behaviour supports, key instructions, advocacy supports, it's such an investment but it pays off to ensure healthcare is provided with dignity and respect and in line with, um, in our case, our daughters and our family's choices. So next slide, please. So, um, and it's important to remember that you can get help to put these kind of documents together because it does take time. Um, so for our family, we've had the benefit of a connected care or sometimes they're called a nurse navigator but we've also used clinical nurse coordinators who um, are connected to different specialty areas. And of course, our family GP, um, the amazing GP. So engaging with these hospital healthcare roles and particularly having a good relationship with the GP has meant we've made being able to safely avoid even going to hospital in the first place, avoid complications in hospital and also get home sooner. So when we have a planned hospital admission, we make sure we have these key documents up to date and printed and ready to find quickly. And so that they're there when we have any unplanned admissions or emergencies. And we also prepare by having a small pre-packed bag with key necessities and a tailored checklist. Um, we have stuck on the wall uh, what to take for admissions and appointments so we don't miss things. So the last slide, please. So the hope is when you know your rights and when you're prepared, then you're being more empowered, you're more confident, and ultimately that makes you less stressed. And that can only lead to better health outcomes for the individual with a disability, their family, and also for the health system itself. So finally, even when wearing a mask, and we've had to do that a bit lately in going to hospital, the eyes, you can still see people, their smile with their eyes. So. That's my last tip is be that person that smiles that you can even see through the mask because even in an especially in a stressful hospital setting during COVID-19, that friendly smile can make a huge difference to you, your family and hospital staff because we're all people first and people living with a disability and their patients and their carers and health staff, that's all second. Um, thank you.